Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is a prophecy that came true during the lifetime of the prophet. Mm. Along with your son. Uh, Java, I think. I didn't see the Arabic, so I don't know if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, reported that the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, came back from a journey. And as he was near Medina, there was a violent gale, like a burst of wind. Uh, and it was so violent that the mountain felt like it was about to be pushed, pressed, right? And the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, in response to this, this wind has brought news that, of the death of a hypocrite. And right when they reached Medina, they were told that a notorious hypocrite from amongst the hypocrites had, had died. And this was a, an influential Jew who's, mm. you know, like Abdullah bin Sabah, that kind of guy. But yeah. And far bin Next one. From among my followers, the prophet said, there will be some who say fornication is permissible. Men wearing silk is permissible. Intoxicants are permissible. And musical instruments are permissible. And this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And if you have been paying attention, you will see that there there are so-called Muslims who have said all of these things. Yeah. So let, let's go to the next one. Quran, yeah. they they fulfill two, three, and four. They say men wearing mm -hmm. silk is fine. Intoxicants are permissible. They, they basically they they take a verse from the Quran which says, uh, "Oh, you who believe, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated." And they say, "Oh, see, so you know, it's okay to drink, just don't pray while you do it." Mm. <laughs> you know? And then they say, oh, uh, music, musical instruments, uh, they're not prohibited in the Quran. Just take, just take uh, you know, it, it's like the prophecy from before about the Quran, you know, the, the 11th yeah. one. Um, so 2, 3, and 4 already, Quran, you <laughs> they, they fulfill. Yeah. Fortification is permissible. You think about that. You can see right there. Uh, and you, you, you might have seen this. Some, some people are going around saying, oh, you know, Muslim women can marry non-Muslim men. You know, it's okay. What's the problem or whatever? And it, but the thing is, like that, literally just makes the marriage null by default, yeah. and it makes the fornication permissible. Even uh, Shia who do uh, muta marriage, oh, muta. right? Yeah. True, true. So basically, they have this temporary marriage, which isn't in Islam. Like it, it's abrogated in Islam, which means it doesn't exist. Uh, it was allowed at one point in Islam, but then it was abrogated until the Day of Judgment. If you, can you just go back to the slide? Because I have one other thing. I want to say. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So uh, they say that, so basically they do this sort of temporary marriage where they marry a girl for like a week, a weekend or whatever. They, uh, you know, have intercourse with her and then they divorce. So that's considered fornication in Islam. Uh, yeah. Intoxicants, I also thought about how there are Muslims who, like westernized Muslims will say, you know, alcohol is haram. Yes, alcohol is haram, but weed, there's Ooh. nothing wrong with weed, marijuana, and these sorts of drugs. Whereas intoxicants, uh, anything that intoxicates you is not allowed in Islam, but there will be these more liberalized Muslims and they're saying, no, we can have weed. The Quran doesn't say weed, it says alcohol. It says wine and this and that, right? Yeah, there's actually a prophecy specifically about that. Mm. That people, another one, which, and it's not in here, uh, it says that there will be people who make intoxicants permissible by saying, by calling it another name. Hmm. So, you know, it, it says khamar, right? And generally, the Arabs understand that to be uh, just alcohol, like wine, you know, beer, that kind of thing, right? But it's it it's every intoxicant. And so some people, they're like, you can you even see this a little bit, not nearly as much uh, as it is in the West, just a tiny bit. Some people say, oh, you know what? Uh, some Arabs, they're like, oh, you know, weed is okay because it says khamar, you know? Yeah. It doesn't say uh, intoxicant, it's just khamar, but it's like, you know, they're calling it another name. Uh, oh, yeah, and also for the fourth one, some people completely reject this hadith uh, based off false pretenses, and they say, oh, no, no, musical instruments are permissible. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Music so, in yeah. Haram is in the Quran, and uh, like the Sahaba agreed that the ayah, there's yeah. an ayah in Surah Al Luqman, which is talking about. It's in the beginning of Surah Luqman, and the companion said that this is about music. And, and yet yeah. there are people, like I'll give you a name right now. Shabir Ali is someone who believes that music is permissible, even though it's oh, clearly... Oh, that guy is something yeah. else, man. <laughs> all, right, all right, let's go to the next one. Uh, the quality of that picture is not that good. You're going to have to excuse that. But uh, this is about the Byzantine comeback. This is, this is in the Quran. Almost everything else has been uh, the Hadith, but this is in the Quran. So in Surah Al-Rum, right in the beginning, it says, 
the Byzantines have been defeated in, in the nearest land. But they, after their defeat, will triumph within three to nine years. Three to nine years. Uh, and uh, the rest of the verse is there, and the verse after. But basically what happened was the, the Byzantines and the Sassanids have been at war for a while, right? I think it was years at this point. Uh, like a full, blown-out war, right? And the Byzantines, as we can see back here, they, you know, that that's where their borders were. But what happened was the Sassanids had a massive streak of victories, and they took all of Greater Syria, they took Egypt, they took Armenia, they took all of Anatolia. You see how how much land you compare that to the, the picture from before. You see how much land they took from the Byzantines. The Byzantines were, were on the brink of destruction. And right when this happens, the prophet uh, recites the Quran, which says the Byzantines will triumph within three to nine years. So this is from a history book. It says the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, and this is not a Muslim guy. He says, at the time when this prediction is said to have been delivered about this prophecy, no prophecy could be more distant from its accomplishment since the first 12 years of the Byzantine king Heraclius, Heraclius and after the approaching dissolution of the Byzantine Empire. Dude, they, they were complete. They're going to be destroyed. It's over. Why would the prophet make such a risky prophecy within three to nine years? Yeah. This empire, who is right on the brink of collapse, about to be completely conquered by their by their enemy is going to make it come why would he say that so not Quran, only is it a risky prophecy that's difficult to be fulfilled like you you don't expect it to be fulfilled you expect the opposite but then he's put a time limit on it so this is a prophet making stuff up and he's putting a time limit why would he do that so this is a revelation yeah. from allah exactly and and to even add on top of that if some people say oh uh, well you know hadiths were written later after these things were done this is the quran the quran is was not transmitted through manuscripts through writings the main transmission was oral people recited it in public and they memorized it themselves so if if someone was to you know if, if we accept these you know delusional people who say oh you know they uh, uh they they made this verse up afterwards or whatever how would that happen when the Quran is recited in public, when the Quran is memorized by the Muslims everywhere, right? How would they just come in and then just say, oh, no, no, guys, there's a new verse. Check this out about something that happened. Oh, yeah, by the way, this verse, even though none of you have ever heard of it before, uh, it was uh, seven years ago. Uh, it was made seven years ago. It's literally impossible. It's completely logistically impossible. It's it's delusion to to attempt to say otherwise, right? And, and this is what one of the, I don't know, man, it, <laughs> Yeah. You can fill in the blanks. I'm, I'm a little bit speechless just because of how baffling some people are, you know, when they make these kinds of claims. Yeah, like, so we have prophecies that are fulfilled in the prophet's time, just after the prophet's time, like some yeah. centuries later, in our times, like, whatever g game you're going to play, the best explanation is, it's revelation. If you say, oh, yeah. all these early prophecies were made up. Okay, but that doesn't explain all the data, because that doesn't explain how come there are prophecies that are being fulfilled today. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that how, explanation how, has holes. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it, it it's it's just desperation, really, because it, it gives no explanation at all for the prophecy specific, unintuitive, unexpected prophecies that came to hundreds of years later. It's, it's and, just. And, and the know, other thing is there are a lot crazy. of prophecies in the Quran. Like I have a list. It's like we can go through it one of these days, but it's not just the Hadith. We talk a lot about the Hadith and there are amazing prophecies in the Hadith, but they're also some very interesting prophecies in the Quran, like the one we're talking about today. So yeah, it, it makes most sense when you bring it together. Yes, the Quran has prophecies, and yes, the Hadith has prophecies, and they're both specific, and they're both uh, pro proofs of Islam. Yes, 100%. All right, next one. Oh, uh, yeah, basically, so this was the Sassanids. Uh, oh, yeah, th this is like the fulfillment. This is the Sassanids, when this prophecy was made. This is some years later. Complete comeback. The, the Byzantines took back everything. Everything they lost, they took it back. So, and, and the thing is, the prophecy was just that they would make a comeback. And then 
it didn't say they would take back everything, and yet they did take everything. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, so, uh, so there were a, a number of these sort of victories until, uh, you know, they became larger and larger. So even one victory would count as a fulfillment of the prophecy. What's very interesting is that uh, one of the days, one of the victories is the same day that the Arabs reported, like the Sahaba reported, I think it's Ibn Abbas, that uh, the same day they won, the Romans won, is the same day that uh, the Muslims won the Battle of Badr. The reason that's yeah. interesting is because when the prophecy is made in the Quran, it says, And that day, the believers will be rejoicing uh, with, uh, with the victory or with the aid of Allah. He aids whoever he wills. So even from that perspective, that after mentioning this prophecy, it even mentions that that day the believers will rejoice. And that's the same day the believers won the battle of Badr. So it's a very specific yeah. process. Yeah, it's it's amazing. All right, now, now we actually go to the next one, um, and we're almost at the end. We're almost at one of my favorite ones, which is going to be the last one. Uh, so this is also during the lifetime of the Prophet. The disbelievers would not attack the Muslims after the Battle of the Trench, and the Battle of the Trench is when it's a battle where the Muslims were like it really seemed they were done for. You know, they were completely surrounded by the kafar. Uh, from the Qurayshis in the north, right? Uh, and then they even had an enemy from within. The Jews that were to the south of them, they were they were just about to um, uh, what's called betray the Muslims and break the truce, and then come and kill them. But through a battle of the wits, one of the companions turned it all around, broke apart their forces, and then the Muslims uh, were set free. And then they, you know, the rest is history. So, yeah, uh, this is a hadith that Suleiman, he said, when the clans were driven away after the Battle of the Trench, I heard the Prophet them say, from now on, we will go and attack them. The people who attack us, we will go and attack them. And they will not come to attack us, but we will go to them. So, and, and this is exactly what happened. After the Battle of the Trench, completely flipped. They were, the Muslims were on the offense. They were finally, they had finally had enough power to break apart the people who were trying to kill them for so many years, uh, and yeah, if, if you read if you read the you know the biography biography of the prophet, you'll see that this is the truth. Anyways, next one: the Muslims will fall into the same traps as the Jews and the Christians did. So the prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "Wait, did I put a source for this?" Yes, yeah, Sahih Bukhari. The prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "You will follow the ways of those nations who were before you, span by span, cubit by cubit." So much so that if they entered the hole of a lizard, you would follow them. The companions, they, they replied, do you mean the Jews and the Christians? And the prophet said, who else? Okay. So the, the Muslims would fall into the same traps. They would follow the Jews and the Christians in, in their mistakes. And if you if you look at a lot of the innovation and bid'ah and you know, even shirk that you see uh, today, a lot of it is just copying the Jews and the Christians, right? False holidays, uh, celebrating the birthdays. Of, of prophets and you know saints even saint worship you know calling out to these people who are dead you know like the shi'is and some of the extreme sufis yeah, even like uh, even uh, to the point the of grave worship, worship of ali radiallahu anh, that the shia do yeah. the, this is just yeah. copying christianity it's just the same path of the christians the calling upon saints yeah. it's and the extreme scholar veneration uh is uh, very prevalent among jews and also christians the fact mm -hmm. that Muslims like are celebrating Christmas. What's Christmas about? The birth of quote unquote the Son of God. SubhanAllah, Allah doesn't have a son. And yet they're Muslims. <laughs> they're celebrating it. Uh, and they just following the Jews and Christians and everything. Well, because, you know, Christians, so many Christians live in the West and this and that. It, it, it's the same traps. Yeah. And uh, to go even further, this is more of an anecdotal thing, but I've I've even seen mm. some some Muslims, quote, quote unquote Muslims, do the, the same trick about the story of Allah that the, that the Christians do. So the, the Pro, it's usually Protestants who do this, by the way. Uh, Christians, they're like, oh, no, no, the story of Allah, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. No, no, that, that's not about uh, homosexuality. That's about rape, you know? It's about rape. It's not yeah. about homosexuality. They completely just twist it, you know? And I've even seen some quote-unquote Muslims using the same excuse about Allah and the Quran 
as if they've they've never even read the Quran because it's so explicit. Yeah, it's so interesting because the Quran, Lut says to them, the Prophet Lut in the Quran says to them basically that why, why are you going to men? Just go to women instead. So according to the, this logic, he's saying stop raping men, rape women. What is this? <laughs> yeah, it's it's just ridiculous, man. I don't know. All right, last one. This is my. This is. You know, I, I was just in bed one day. I think it was like four a.m. or something. I couldn't sleep, and by chance, I happened upon this hadith. I was just. I just saw this completely out of nowhere. It wasn't anybody explaining it or anything like that, and I already knew about the historical background of this. So when I read the hadith, immediately, I knew the exact event that was being talked about. Because of how precise and how exact and how, like, it, it was honestly shocking uh, when I read this hadith. And I, immediately I knew what it was talking about. So uh, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Some of my people will, will be on low-lying ground, which they will call al basra beside a river called the Tigris River, basically, right? And over there is a the bridge. The people... Of this area will be numerous and it will be one of the capital cities of immigrants and in another narration it's one of the capital cities of the muslims and then it says at the end of time the descendants of Qantura will come with broad faces i might have mispronounced that and small eyes and they will come on the bank of the river and then the town's inhabitants will separate into three sections one which will follow cattle and live in the desert and perish another which will seek security from themselves for themselves and they were they will perish slash disbelief. The Arabic word is kafal, right? So it, it could mean, you know, the the security is taken away from them or they, they're just disbelievers. And then a, th a third section, uh, a third, yeah, third section, they will put their children on their backs and they will fight the invaders. And they will be the martyrs. So let's break this down into bullet points. So it will happen in a region called by the name of Basra. This did not exist during the time of the Prophet. It will be a city that has become a capital city for the Muslims slash immigrants. This city will be next to the Tigris River. And a people with broad faces and small eyes will come and invade it. And then the inhabitants will be split into three. A group which flees, a group which seeks security, a group that fights. So basically the inhabitants will either, will either flee and die, submit and die slash disbelieve, or fight and die. It's pretty explicit it's pretty specific down to the region down to the history of the the region of the city uh down to the race ethnicity of the people who invade and then even what happens to the inhabitants of the of the city there is only one event that this could be referring to the mongol siege of baghdad in 1258 which coincidentally happened two years after the fire of Hijaz, which I mentioned right in the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. So just, just look at how it lines up. Right outside the gates of ba uh, Baghdad was an area called Bab Basra, the door of Basra at the time. Baghdad was a capital for the Muslims for a very long time. The, it had the, the house of wisdom. You know, if, if you know anything about history, you, you'll heard of ancient Baghdad before the Mongol siege of of the area, right? Yeah. It was massive in knowledge. It was massive in sciences. It was massive in inhabitants. One of the biggest cities in the world, right? And <clears throat> if you if you know anything about the siege, you will know that this is called the end of the golden age for Islam. After this, it was over for the Muslims. Basically, the, their golden age was done, right? Mm -hmm. And you look, every single detail is there. Bab Basra, right outside, the house of wisdom, the ca a capital city for the Muslims for centuries, a capital city for immigrants as well, because of you know all the knowledge that was there. The immigrants would come come there and like they would learn and study and and teach and do all this kind of stuff. And then the Tigris River passes right through it. And then again, you you go and you see even the race of the Mongols is mentioned in this hadith. Look, broad faces, small eyes, the Mongols, exactly as described. So, and you. Go next, and, and there's still there's still more to it. That, that's what's so amazing to me. You you read the first half and you're like that's amazing, and you read the second half and you're like there's still more, you know. And the inhabitants will split into three sections, and the implication here is that it will be a complete slaughter. 
a complete slaughter. And that's what happened. The Muslims were killed. Every single Muslim that the Mongols could find, they killed. Because the, the city didn't surrender to them immediately. Th this is what they did. This is, the Mongol, this is what the Mongols did. If someone doesn't surrender to them, once they siege them, they will kill every, every single person. That's what they used to do. And that's what they did to the Muslims in Baghdad. Some of the only people who were spared were the Christians and Shiris. That's it. That's it. At Tulsi, he helped the Mongols. He invited them. He sabotaged the Muslims and, and brought this upon them, right? And the Christians, the, the reason they were spared is because I think uh, the Hal Halgul Khan, which was the guy who, the Mongol leader who at the time, his mother was a Christian. That's it. Mm. Basically, only the father were spared. And if you look at the death tolls, it's up to 2 million civilians killed in the siege. In 1258, the entire city was destroyed. This is why they say it was the end of the golden age of Muslims. And even on the lowest estimate from quote unquote Western sources, hundreds of thousands of civilians were slaughtered. The implication is that it will be a complete slaughter, and that's what it was. And you, yeah, it's it's just amazing how specific this prophecy was that just when I read it, immediately I knew what it, what it was talking about. Location. The, the history of the city, what happened, the race of the people, the race of the invaders. It's its just something else. Uh, oh yeah, to add on to that, even the description of a city that did not exist at the time. The city did not even exist at the time. And you, you, you can see, I, I already mentioned this stuff, uh, most of the other things, but yes, it's just amazing. That, that's just like a mind-blowing prophecy. And these things, these are signs. Like, these are 25, even some prophecies have, some uh, prophecies that he put as number 25, they had multiple prophecies, like this one had multiple details in it. So you can say like 25 or more signs from God that the Prophet Muhammad is truthful, that this is a message from God. So, you know, atheists and this and that, they keep demanding miracles. Well, here it is, right? But of course, the people who don't have clean hearts, they don't have goodness in them, they're going to keep making excuses. And this is what Allah says. وَأَقْسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَحْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ لَإِنْ جَاءَتْهُمْ آيَةٌ لَيُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهَا قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْآيَاتُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَمَا يُشْعِرُكُمْ أَنَّهَا إِذَا جَاءَتْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ They swear by Allah, their more, most forceful oaths, that if a sign comes to them, they will surely believe in it. Say the signs are, are with Allah alone. And what will make you realize that even if they did come, they will not believe. So this is the state of people who don't believe. Whoever wants to believe, it's good for them. Whoever wants to disbelieve, then there's a painful punishment. Yeah, like there's so many prophecies. All of these, all of these just amazing, amazing, objective evidence, right? And just think to yourself, at what point is it enough, right? 25 prophecies, 50 prophecies, 70, 80, 90, 100? More than 100? Is that not enough for you? When is it enough for you? Right? Is it, will it only be enough once you die and it's too late to turn back? You know, but yeah, that, that's that's my closing statement for, for this. That's all I, I really want to say for now. Well, Jazakallah Khairan. Um, there are more prophecies on the, on the website, I think, if you want to check them out. Uh, Inshallah, we might do this another time. But for now, assalamu alaikum, guys. Take care. Uh, and jazakallah khairan for uh, coming on. Again, his website is provingislam.com. This channel is also called Proving Islam, but we're actually two different. We're independent of each other. But yeah, great that we could have this. This is by chance, you know? Yeah. So jazakallah khairan, and we'll end it there. Assalamu alaikum. All right.